Hi, this is Paula from CHE. Today we have two interviews about Nova Scotia's plan to reopen schools in September. We spoke with Paul Wozni, president of the Nova Scotia Teachers Union, and with Ray Frazier, a Cape Breton parent who has three children in school. The provincial government is planning a full return to school on September 8. Students from grades 10 to 12 and staff will be required to wear masks in areas where social distancing is impossible, except for classrooms. Cleaning in schools will be increased, including during the day, and new signs encouraging hand washing and physical distancing will be installed. Minister of Education Zach Churchill said that students with underlying health conditions will study from home and staff with underlying health conditions would be provided with the necessary personal protective equipment. If COVID-19 cases start to flare up, a hybrid plan will be implemented. Younger children will be in smaller classes and grades 9 to 12 will study from home. The worst case scenario, if the number of COVID cases grows, schools will close and all students will take classes from home. Here's Paul Wesney, president of the Nova Scotia Teachers Union, with a stake on the government's plan. In, in some respects, it, 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 has, uh, it has merit. Um, you know, the, the Nova Scotia's plan is the only plan that makes a commitment uh, to ensuring that uh, students and school staff that have pre-existing health conditions and at, you know, at, you know, at heightened risk of COVID um, are going to be provided with PPE by the system. Uh, that that hasn't been offered by any other plan in Canada, so um, you know I think that that's a that's an important note. Um, you know the the plan is flexible, so the minister has indicated that uh, you know the plan we're able to make adjustments where necessary in response to COVID, either on a school level, community level, entire regional center, or province wide, depending on what's happening. Uh, so I think that that's a that's a you know that's a, an important feature. Um, you know, but there, there remain some real, uh, some major concerns uh, with the plan. Um, you know, we, the original phase one called for uh, reduced class sizes with full physical distancing from P to nine. And then high school students were going to attend on a rotating basis um, to ensure that physical distancing could occur at the high school level. Um, and uh, so, you know, we, we felt, you know, we, we felt good that that plan um you know would allow you know would, would allow COVID to be uh you know sort of suppressed in, in schools even while kids were present and then suddenly without notice the government changed tack on that and said no we're going to have everybody back full time and, and we expressed concerns right from the get-go when that when that change was announced they never supplied us with any kind of epidemiological information to say you know why that move was safe or responsible. Um, so we, we, we had questions that remain unanswered going back a month. Um, and, you know, now that the plan is known to the public, we know that parents and students and other people that work in schools share those same concerns. I mean, you know, schools are the only place in Nova Scotia where physical distancing apparently doesn't matter, right? Schools are the only places in Nova Scotia where it doesn't matter that you wear a mask if you're in public. Um, so all of the things that Nova Scotians have done uh, to keep infection rates low, um, to protect our healthcare system, um, you know, it's been really, really hard. We've all paid a price, but we we're in a good place, really. You know, we have very low infection rates. Um, it, it, we're abandoning those those strategies to go back to school, um, and I guess the major concern is this is uh, this is the biggest system that we've tried to reboot um, in the COVID nineteen era, and it daily impacts 150,000 Nova Scotians. Um, and I think we can imagine, you know, if we have an outbreak of COVID-19 in our schools, all it takes is a bad 48 hours and you can be in really serious trouble with COVID-19 after a very long stretch of, uh, you know, of low case numbers. I think we've seen, we've seen that in BC. Uh, we've seen that in Alberta, you know, really they were fine for a long time and then wham, you know, they got hit with cases. So, um, you know, lots of parents are worried about the likelihood that we um, that we we lift the limits on travel outside the Atlantic bubble. Um, you know, so there's a lot of questions, and uh, it's really not clear that the plan is going to keep uh, students and teachers safe based on what we know works. And uh, until those questions are answered, uh, you know, the the lack of confidence that's been expressed in the plan is only going to grow. Have you heard from teachers in rural areas? Is the situation different? 
I mean, the concerns are there for, for teachers in rural schools. I think there's an assumption that, um, you know, when you look at the plan, it sort of, it, it makes this assumption that um, classrooms in Nova Scotia are, are all an equal size and, you know, you can, they're big enough that you can just distance the kids with the, with the existing numbers. Um, and we know, you know, in some rural communities, class sizes may be smaller um, and you might be able to physically distance uh, kids uh, within the existing spaces of a school. Um, you know, but in many rural communities, schools are consolidated and class sizes are not small and class sizes are very large in, in these communities. So even though they're small communities, um, the class sizes aren't small because we, we've closed community schools and we've got one sort of mega school where all the kids go for, you know, you drop a pin in a map and, you know, for an hour, kids bus in. So, um, you know, teachers in rural communities have that, that concern about whether or not this is truly safe. Um, it's not universally true, but in many rural communities, you know, school buildings are older. Um, you know, and we now know that the, you know, the federal government's um, guidelines for safe return to schools um, provide funding. Um, to, uh, to retrofit buildings that don't have appropriate, um, you know, ventilation and air circulation capacity. Um, you know, I think a lot of people in rural communities, when you drive by your school building, you know that your building was built a very, very long time ago and that ventilation is poor uh, if, if it exists at all. Um, you know, so there, there are, you know, there certainly are concerns that I think people in, in, in rural Nova Scotia, the sort of aspects of, of this plan, um, that uh, they probably hit home in, in a way in rural communities that they they might not in communities where schools are newer or, um, or, or the buildings are in better repair. Would you know what's the average number of children in a classroom is for the province? Well, we know that the, the class cap guidelines for Nova Scotia are, um, I think it's, you know, 25 plus 2 um, from P to 2. Uh, I think you can have as many, I think it's 28 plus two for, uh, you know, in, up to the end of junior high. And then when you get into high school, it can be 30 plus additional two. Um, and that's a paper number, really. You know, really that number, um, schools have many classes that far exceed those guidelines before uh, the date that class caps are, are monitored. Um, and, you know, once school classes are rearranged to be compliant with those numbers, um, you know, sort of in the early fall, um, you know, it's, it's, it's common for classes to exceed those numbers all the time. So, um, you know, on average, you know, the, you know, the average, if you, if you took all of the students in Nova Scotia and divided them by the number of classrooms, we're, we're probably, you know, high 20s, uh, 30 kids per, per room on average, all things considered, um, you know, and that's, you know, I don't know that an average number on the whole, a global average number is necessarily helpful. Um, I think the bigger question is, you know, I think people need to connect the question of physical distancing to the particular classroom where your particular student is going to learn, right? Some, some schools have bigger spaces than others. Uh, and it may be possible for some schools to physically distance kids fully um, within the existing space. Whereas in some schools, even with small class sizes, you, if physical spaces are very small, and we have lots of old schools where you know, classroom spaces are very small to, to begin with, um, it's not possible even to distance small numbers of students um, based on the existing class sizes. So it's, um, you know, I, I know that people like an easy figure to reference, but um, it's, not, it's not a very straightforward conversation because classrooms are not universally built to a certain specification, and we don't have identical numbers of students in, in all classrooms and all grades. Looking at this program that was offered by the government, would you be able to say if the number of jobs for teachers will be the same, if it's going to be larger or smaller? Yeah, we, I don't know that you know, we certainly haven't seen any additional funding earmarked to hire more full-time teachers. Um, you know, there certainly are questions about um, how we're going, how substitute teachers are going to be deployed um, across the system. You know, the plan seems to indicate that substitute teachers will be expected to work within sort of a, a more limited range of schools than they normally would. Um, those details haven't been shared with us to, to be able to pass along to substitutes. 
Um, and, you know, for substitute teachers, you know, substitute teachers in Nova Scotia are among the most poorly paid in the country. Um, and so uh, a lot of substitute teachers will have to need that information to evaluate whether or not they can afford to continue to do substitute teacher work if it's going to decrease the amount of days that they can work if they're going to be paid on a day to day basis. So there's been no signal that there's an intention to pay substitute like to hire them on full time so that they can sustain and be available, even if they don't necessarily substitute every day. Um, the government has indicated to the teachers union that um, they intend to make sure that enough people are available to cover off, um, you know, school staff that are sick. They intend to hire uh, people that aren't qualified teachers in every part of the province um, to, you know, to provide coverage. So that's a concern. You know, we, we, we have limited instances where um, people who aren't necessarily fully certified teachers are working in schools on a limited basis. Um, historically, that's sort of been restricted to the Tri-County region. That would be Shelburne, Digby, Yarmouth counties, schools in that area. And then the other, uh, uh, the CSAP um, has had teachers, you know, because of the, the need for French first language uh, speakers, um, you know, they, they have had access to, to people that maybe aren't fully qualified teachers, but are, are fully francophone to be in classrooms. But this is the first time in Nova Scotia's history that the Department of Education appears to be um, open to hiring non-qualified teachers system-wide to make sure that, you know, there, there are people who can cover off classes. And, um, you know, we, we recognize that we want people, we want to be able to continue to operate schools. Uh, but it's unclear what the impact on student learning will be when um, adults that have no background in, in teaching and no experience doing the work are, are, are in front of students and expected to deliver quality learning. This has been happening before the pandemic. Uh, y yes, but again, I say on, on a very limited basis. It's, it has never been province-wide. And really, the situation is assessed from year to year. Um, and whether or not that practice continues is sort of a joint decision has historically been a joint decision between the union, a regional center, and the Department of Education. Um, the Department of Education has announced to the union that um, they're not going to seek to uh, share approval. They're just going to hire people who aren't qualified teachers all across the province in every regional center in an effort to make sure that there are people who are available to cover classes when teachers need to be uh, either are sick or are required to self-isolate. Just clarifying to make sure I understood. So th this has been happening, uh, but there also there isn't an increased budget to hire more people now, right? Now, my understanding of the increased budget is not to hire more teachers. There, the minister did reference $15 million in new spending to support the implementation of inclusive education. So there, some of those people will be teachers, but most of them will be uh, other staff like child and youth care workers, uh, teaching assistants. Uh, there will be a very small number of um, uh, not, you know, people people that t used to be in the union, but are no, you know, the government is forcing them out. Speech language pathologists, school psychologists, um, and school based social workers. So some of those, a very small amount of that money is going to go to hire teachers specifically intended to support inclusive education. Um, there is some more spending for school staff to support and to, to deliver the enhanced cleaning uh, that the government has committed to in the plan, but none of that money that I know of is intended to increase the number of full-time teachers or, term, or, or substitute teachers under term contract to make sure that there are people available to teach when, uh, when teachers can't be in classes. So, uh, so far as I know, effectively that money is for just about every kind of staff imaginable but teachers. That was actually my next question. So there's going to be increased cleaning. Are teachers going to be taking care of that or are more people going to be hired, cleaning staff going to be hired for that? The, the answer is a bit foggy really. Based on what we know, uh, you know, the government has earmarked some funding and they have announced that there's gonna be a round of hiring to hire more custodial and janitorial staff. Um, in, in all of the, you know, that those hires will be spread across the province. Obviously, th those aren't our members, but they, they work in schools with teachers. So that's, that's a good thing. Um, whether or not the additional hires are, is, actu is actually enough staffing to do all the cleaning 
that's outlined in the plan remains to be seen. Um, we are hearing from the department that the department doesn't think that sanitizing um, teaching spaces or learning spaces is the same thing as cleaning. Um, so the idea that, you know, uh, you know, it looks like the department is going to take the view that if a teacher works at a desk, um, that it's reasonable to expect that teacher to sanitize that area themselves before they use it or after they use it. It appears that they're also considering, um, you know, the desks and the chairs that students sit at, they, they may expect students to sanitize those areas. Um, you know, and I don't really know that I, I agree that that is safe or wise. Um, you know, uh, to expect teachers and kids as young as four uh, to be sanitizing their own learning spaces. Um, you know, I don't know if that's a reasonable or a safe expectation. So again, that's, we, we don't have firm commitments on that yet, but it's sort of what we're hearing in discussion in the reopening planning process. But, um, you know, that's, uh, that, that remains a question that we need to see addressed. How is that enhanced cleaning going to, how do we have assurances that it's going to happen and who is going to do it? And, and really there remain a bunch of questions there. So that's kind of everything I know about that. Do you think that now that the premier has announced he's stepping down, do you think that will change something? Uh, I, I don't know. Um, you know, I think in some respects, you know, the, you know, the, the leadership that the, the premier and, you know, Dr. Strang have, have provided through COVID has, um, you know, has stabilized the province, especially in the early days. Um, but I think the further we get into reopening, um, you know, we haven't seen the government resume normal operation. Um, there is an inability of opposition parties to participate in debate and discussion um, and hold the government to account on decisions related to, you know, any number of things, but, you know, especially school reopening. Um, so I think that's, that's of concern. Um, you know, if the only people that make decisions are a handful and they never have to answer for their decisions or provide a rationale, um, you know, I believe that, that parents uh, of, of children who are going to send their, you know, they're going to send their kids to school buildings, they deserve transparency. They deserve to know what's the science behind these decisions, um, who is responsible for making them. Um, and who is going to be accountable to answer to parents, you know, who have concerns, who's going to communicate with them. I think it's really important to highlight that this is all happening at a time when the government has terminated or wiped out, for all Anglophone parents at least, school board trustees who, whether you think they were great or not, once were charged with the responsibility of, of directly representing the interests of parents and students. And the government got rid of them. And the government promised that the Minister of Education would be far more accessible, far more communicative, and far more um, you know, decisive in answering parents on matters relating to public education. And from what I'm hearing from parents, no one's getting answers from the Department of Education. Um, and we're two and a half weeks away, and people really don't know whether they should send their kids back or not. So, um, you know, this is not a government that has enhanced communication with parents. This is not a government that has enhanced confidence in public education. Um, you know, our own internal polling uh, in the teachers union has shown that, you know, almost 70% of Nova Scotians believe that, you know, that the policies and the approach of Stephen McNeil on public education has actually harmed uh, the quality of, of public education in our schools um, and certainly hasn't improved things. So, um, I, I certainly hope that, you know, I, I think that the traditional political Wisdom is that, you know, a leader who announces a resignation tends to be more sensitive to, uh, you know, sort of the, the desires and the consensus of uh, their own caucus. You know, uh, you know, I think it would be good if, if that were the case, um, you know, with, with the premier. But um, whether that works out that way or not, I guess we, we, it remains to be seen. Whether the premier will change the way that he has operated his government. Um, you know, while he sort of is a, is a placeholder until a new leader is elected or not. Um, but uh, I think everybody's waiting to see that. Those are all my questions. Uh, would you like to add something? I think the only thing I would add is, um, you know, I think 
we have seen, uh, you know, on so many parents, um, families and students, you know, everybody who works in schools has so many questions that are unanswered by the plan. Um, and the government is not communicating with us at all. They announced the plan, I mean, it's getting close to three weeks ago. There's been no follow up. Um, you know, I think Nova Scotians, you know, we, we can look into our recent past, you know, when the government announced its approach to, you know, uh, addressing the tragedy in port um, you know, Nova Scotians universally rose up and said, this is not good enough. A panel of review that doesn't have the ability to get the answers that Nova Scotians deserve is not good enough. We deserve a full public inquiry. Um, when Nova Scotians stand together and, and, and put pressure on government, we've seen this government recognize that it needs to do better. And we've seen this government change course. So, you know, uh, you know, where so many people are, are afraid and deeply worried about a, 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 that school is not safe to return to under the current plan, that's the kind of pressure we need to band together uh, to create. Um, and I would call on everybody to be in contact with their MLA. Uh, and express their concerns so that we can, we can, we still have time to get this plan right before we go back to school. And I would encourage people to contact their MLA and join teachers in pushing for measures that uh, we can all feel confident will keep students and, and staff safe at school. Now you'll hear from Ray Frazier from Bay St. Lawrence. He has two children studying at North Highlands Elementary and one at Cabot Education Center. Here's his take on the back to school plan. How was your experience with the kids at home during the pandemic? Uh, good and bad. The um, well, love having the kids around, lo love spending time with the kids. The GNS Pass learning setup seemed kind of uh, disjointed, right? Some teachers are really good at it, some weren't good at it at all. Um, but otherwise, it was pretty good. The, the kids much preferred their teacher to their mom and dad, admittedly, right? but um, it wasn't bad, right? What do you think about the plan of schools reopening in September? So far, I think the plan is seems horrible. From uh, everything I read, the number one way to reduce the spread of COVID-19 in the classroom setting is to have smaller classroom sizes. But if that's the number one way, that's where all our focus should be and if and if that's a group of 10 then the classroom size should be 10 and if that means you have to have split classes during the day and hire more staff i mean that's fine there's there's no sense having a uh, pandemic run through any community if you can just stop it beforehand by doing the number one recommendation of shrinking the class size would you still like to see the schools open the school y yes and no I want to see the schools open if there's a plan that makes sense, but I don't want to see the schools open for the sake of opening and we're just going to hope that the epidemiology level stays the way it is today. You, you want to see the class open to face a worst case scenario, not a wait and see scenario. So if there are measures in place that meet international standards for schools and class size and hand washing stations, then yes, open up school. But there's no sense doing anything halfway, right? There's not. Like, you, you're just setting yourself up for failure. So what are you going to do in September? Are you going to send the kids to school? Well, we'll wait and see when September comes. We're, we're playing both sides. Uh, we're all set to homeschool if need be. But you never know. Maybe the government will come through. Maybe there will be a great plan. There's obviously lots of pressure from parents to put something better in place. So hopefully the government listens and it might just be a case where they got to spend money. And right now, spending money to make the school system better is not a bad thing. It's not like our economy's booming. Um, if you got to like even, you know, rent some community halls, have some classroom and all these empty space and buildings we have all throughout Nova Scotia. So you, you can keep the class sizes down. Uh, now go for it. Uh, every, every Nova Scotian could use a little extra the economy right now why not use the school system to do that and keep the kids safe and make things progress in the future i was wondering if there are any specific issues or if the experience is different uh for parents in in rural nova scotia uh yeah so w one of the big differences is like our interview we're not doing this over zoom we're doing it over the, 
the phone because the internet quality here is, is quite poor. So that makes distance learning very difficult uh, for a lot of people. Um, also, um, if anybody takes a walk around any of the, the rural schools in Cape Breton, you'll notice that these schools already lack a lot of services. You'll, you'll notice compared to urban schools, they're pretty bare bones. Um, so do I have faith in a government that delivers a legal approach to school as is to my children to do a good job on, on delivering a school system that could help prevent the spread of COVID-19? I'm unsure. Right? I'm really unsure because uh, the, the program and deliverables right now are, aren't the best. Right. So we'll see. The government said that they consulted parents. Have you heard anything about that? There was a, a, a short survey at, at the end of the GNS Fest, but they have not reached out to consult me uh, as a parent. And I'm not saying I'm, I'm special and I, I need to be consulted above anybody else. But, but as far as I know, there's been nothing, there's been no correspondence to me asking me what, you know, my opinion was or thoughts were or or any ideas whatsoever on, on how to improve things or make things work. And it just seems like right now there's a lack of ideas and but there are ideas out there if, if somebody's willing to listen to them. Have you heard from the school? Uh, yes, we've heard from our principal who's stating that they're, they're working on the, sorry, we've heard from the principal the elementary school, but not the middle school. So the, uh, well, some of my kids are in P to five school. So we've heard from that principal, but not the other one. And the P to five principal said they're working and they're straightening things out and they're still going to need volunteers for a breakfast program and so on and so forth. So it seems like they're doing a, not business as usual approach, but, but trying to make it as much as, quote unquote, normal school as possible is, is the goal. How about your kids? Are they excited to go back to school? The kids want to go back to school and see all their friends and teacher, but to quote my daughter, I don't want to die. <laughs> right? So they are nervous too, right? And they, I mean, everything suddenly changed in the kid's life. And they suddenly had to, you know, their, their normal was changed and they couldn't go to school anymore. And this happens all over the world and other places. And it's really horrible with natural disasters or war torn countries. But it's still a shock to the children. And to have the children now go back to an environment that was at one point declared 100% unsafe for them. And now to suddenly say, oh, you're all going back and still don't hear parents talking and they hear protests and news. And I know I know a lot of the discussion is about the psychological well-being of children going back to school. But I don't know if anybody's looked into the fact that what are the psychological harmfulness of, of going to an environment that used to be considered a safe space, but now isn't? And what's going to be done to help that ahead of time? Because it's about children and their education and their well-being, that's the number one issue. Not providing, you know, daycare for parents, uh, not, you know, making sure that, you know, the economy rolls 100% and so on and so forth. All that is extremely important and all that is, is part of the puzzle. But at the end of the day, it's, it's the child that matters. And their psychology is so important that we have to be mindful of that. And I don't know if that's even in the plan. Right? If it doesn't involve reading through the federal guidelines, it doesn't, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of consideration being given to that. Is there anything that you would like to add? I just think that the, um, the government should not be afraid to spend money to make the schools better and to reduce the class size down to 10 um, even before COVID-19 came around, reduced class size was already cited as a wonderful thing to do. So there's no harm in doing that and putting a plan forward to go through that because there is lots and lots of data to suggest the benefits of a small class size, even if there was no pandemic. Because there is a pandemic, it's a no-brainer. Just spend the money and let's do it and let's keep the kids safe. Would you like to share your opinion about schools reopening? 
You can write to us at chne.television at gmail.com. Thanks for watching.